Hi, good morning. It's uh, April 1st, 2020, and uh, this is another issue or edition of uh, Fun with Aviation. We're here with Bill Morris this morning, and we're going to do a walk around on the uh, YF-16 for everybody. So uh, we're going to go ahead and turn it around because you don't need to see me. So this is a y the uh, YF-16. Bill's going to follow around. I'm going to ask him questions, and uh, we're going to talk about this airplane. This is the first time that the public has really had an opportunity to see this since we uh, brought it out from, uh, uh, from Rome, New York. So first of all, Bill, why don't you tell everybody what this airplane is just a little bit. Well, the, uh, there were two uh, prototype airplanes built to uh, support a flight demonstration program. One of the things that the Air Force noticed in the early 1970s was that fighters kept getting bigger and more expensive. And so there was a group of them up there called the Fighter Mafia that um, came up with a concept of let's go back to nice, simple, lightweight airplanes that do what they were supposed to do without a lot of bells and whistles on them. Uh, and uh, there were two, two aircraft uh, built by General Dynamics and two by Northrop for this uh, flight demonstration program. And in the end, uh, the Air Force decided that uh, this airplane had some potential, so they placed an initial order for 650 of them. And this is really the start of the F-16 program that we know today. Uh, the European Air Forces, there were four Air Forces over there, Belgium, Denmark, Netherlands, and Norway, that were also interested in replacing their old 1950s F-104 fighters uh, with something a little more modern. And in the end, they decided that between them they were going to buy 348, added that to the 650 that the Air Force was going to buy, and it was originally called the 998 program. 998 airplanes are going to be built and that was it only we're still building them today 40 years later well uh, let's tell everybody a little bit about what the differences are between uh, this airplane and the production airplane because these are uh, this the yfs were uh, quite a bit different sure uh, start out in the uh, first area to look at is right here under the nose uh, you can see this this is the original white paint uh, and this is the original nose contour uh, it had no radar, uh, but the forward bulkhead was, you can see, much smaller. Uh, the aircraft was modified uh, to resemble a production airplane, uh, and uh, they recontoured the nose section here. And there were a couple of other things. Uh, well, now, why did, uh, why did the Air Force Research Lab want to do that? Why did they want to change the configuration? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't at that point uh, a research program anymore. It was now, okay, let's put this thing in production. And so you had to start adding things like a, a fire control radar, uh, some more avionics, um, weapon stations on the wing, uh, pylon stations, uh, so you could carry bombs and other ordnance and fuel tanks. Um, and it, was, it just evolved that way. One of the other things that they did uh, with the difference between the the YF and the production airplane is this 10 inch band right here. This was the uh, back end of the forward fuselage sections and this was the front end of the aft section. And we'll show them inside the the, uh, the intake oh, yeah, here where you can patches. see that really clear. Yeah. In fact let's go ahead and do that right now because okay. there's other things. Now if we look in here you're going to be able to clearly see the band around the intake and so that's uh, it's about a 10 inch uh, 10 inch plug bill yeah okay and you can see it better over here with the reflection yeah and uh, our intent is to remove the plug correct yes okay. hopefully okay so that's going to be a major uh, a major that, process that's going to be a major uh, task uh in this whole thing um so as long as we get, we're here by the panel that's open in the canopy uh, it took us about, what, three weeks to get the canopy open? Yes. Uh, why don't you explain to everybody what was going on with well, that? Well, uh, the thing is, is to open up the canopy to check out for any corrosion and stuff in the cockpit. And you can see up here these uh, steel tubes, and they're connected to latches. There's uh, one up forward here in the middle and one on the aft. The aft one on this side was extensively corroded. You can see the rust up in there. And the middle one on the other side was. And so the question was, how do we uh, open the canopy 
uh, doing minimal damage to the structure. And we were managed after about uh, three Saturdays, uh, collective minds got together and we just kept chipping away at it. Uh, to the point that uh, the latches finally did release. Well, we had a couple guys that spent the entire day inside this, this yeah. little compartment this in here, is, didn't uh, they? Yeah. You can see uh, on the uh, on the prototype or the the YF program here, there wasn't a whole lot in here. But on the production airplane today, this whole compartment is filled with uh, avionics, uh, radios. Uh, radar warning systems, uh, all kinds of things, flight control computers. The other thing that's different on the airplane, and you'll notice here on the inlet, uh, during its 40 years at Rome, it was used as an antenna test platform. Uh, they would mount it on a tower and put various electronic systems on and antennas and to, to figure out the best place for the an antennas. And so all these little holes represent different aspects of programs that people wanted tested. Uh, unfortunately, now we have to go find a way to plug all of that and get it back to the original, essentially smooth skin contour. Well, we've got 20 people who are watching right now. So if any of you have got questions, well, I've got Bill here because he's the expert on this. Uh, uh, Bill's not just a volunteer here, but uh, he worked on these airplanes when he was in the uh, in the Air Force. You were program manager on what was it, the C and D models? Yep. Block 15 and then the Block 25. I'm glad you brought the block thing up. A lot of people don't understand what the block means. What is block's uh, well, significance? Uh, when the F-16 program started, there was going to be 650 built, and they were all going to look alike. No changes at all. But as they started in operational experience, uh, they ended up uh, wanting to uh, add some other features, change some things. And so you just can't break those in at some point in the production line and, and hope to capture them all. So what they came up with was a block series so that the first airplanes were essentially block one and then the first set of mods that they wanted to make to it became block five. And then you'd build a whole bunch of airplanes as block five and then you would go to a block 10. Okay. So that's as opposed to models A, B, and C, and D, or do they have models A, B, and C, and D also? They still have A, B, and C, and D, and whatever they get up to. Okay. Um, the, the whole idea was to uh, have some defined configurations okay. in a group of airplanes so that uh, you just didn't uh, put a mod on one of them, and then the next airplane got that mod plus two others. Okay. And, and so it was all designed to, to make it all happen in a nice sequence. There's another thing on the intake here that I think we'd like to show people that uh, if I get down here low enough, if uh, the last you can landing. explain to them what, uh, <laughs> what uh, that, that scuff marks and that, uh, that rust that's on there is. Uh, when uh, this, this is YF number two. When it finished the flight test program out at Edwards, uh, it came back to Fort Worth and was used uh, for a number of other little... Uh, test program efforts and it ended up its career as a chase airplane uh, for delivering production F-16s. You roll an airplane off the line and it's kind of like uh, let's go take it for a test drive and make sure everything works. And what they ended up doing was this plane would fly with a production airplane and, and you see you know make sure the landing gear and everything worked and uh, whatever. Well, it turns out uh, on its last flight, which turned out to be its last flight, the nose landing gear would not come down. Um, so uh, the, uh, the pilot uh, flew it around until he got down to about 800 pounds of, uh, of uh, jet fuel, which is about 70 gallons or something. But, uh, and he brought it in on the main gear, and then it finally, as it slowed down, uh, nosed over and scraped off uh, that bottom section and of course they decided not to repair it uh, so that was essentially its last flight and it is a, a little souvenir of the program that we're going to try to preserve and get the rust off and well some people uh, aren't aware that all this time a lot of people didn't even know where this airplane was but they didn't really realize that it was still working and so this is the longest serving f-16 in the fleet yeah 
and uh, it has been working since uh, since the day it was uh, it was produced. It's never gotten the notoriety that the others that the other YF did because uh, when the the original rollout was being done, this one was probably in a hangar someplace. But let's talk to him a little bit about the wing right here. There's some things here on the wing that I think they might find interesting. Yeah, uh, one of the other things that uh, when the airplane was at uh, Rome Air Development Center, Rome Laboratory today, uh, you can see the this is the strake. It's this little s splitter here that comes out. Uh, the end piece was removed. Uh, we can put that all back on. But the original contour on the YF was this skin was down here and in this place and here. And what they did is to fatten up the strake, they just put these wooden shims in there and uh, now it's another thing we have to remove to get it back to its original contour. But again, these are things that I don't think we really realized when we were getting the airplane. Maybe you can talk to them a little bit about the paint we're seeing up here on the top, too. Yeah, the, uh, the thing on the, the white is actually, uh, well, let's start here with the blue. When the airplane rolled out of the factory, uh, it was painted in a cream-colored blue and a real kind of, I say, off-shade tan. I, I called it... Uh, sky blue and cream colors uh, and then they it reverted to the red white and blue uh, that became typical uh, hallmark for the program and there's the original white paint and you can in some places you can see the red oh which yeah you was, can see a little bit of the red there which yeah. was the, the strakes were red and there's a little bit more red over here oh we've got a question from uh i think it's mike james he was saying where was the airplane stored before the museum got it and uh it really wasn't stored so much as it's been uh, it's been in use at the Air Force Research Lab in Rome, New York. Uh, it's been up on a pedestal about a 50 foot tall tower uh, that they used to do uh, antenna testing. They originally started work out there during the Vietnam War with the F-4s. They were putting so many things on the F-4s uh, that it was starting to interfere with the uh, with the, the radios uh, and the other antennas. So it's been at Rome, New York. It's been on the job. It's been working for 43 years since it left here. And so it was only recently, within the last few months, stored. Uh, it's the process of us acquiring the airplane uh, is a long story, but I'm going to just say that we worked on this for about three years. Uh, one of our, our folks, uh, Ben Guttery, found out that the airplane still existed and it started a long process of inquiring with the people at Rome if they still needed it and then eventually getting to the point where uh, Congresswoman Craig a Kay Granger and her staffers uh, helped and supported us in, in getting the airplane. It also required that we become certified by the United States Air Force Museum to take on loan items from them. So this was a long process. It took almost, uh, almost three years. Now, somebody's asking about being inverted. Uh, the structure that they see here, the crisscross structure, uh, that was part of the frame that they used to mount it on the tower. Yes. Uh this plate down here was what was mounted on top of the uh, the test tower and if you wanted the airplane upside down because uh, you have to put ordnance and stuff on it and they also get a better uh, kind of pattern uh, if it's not on the encumbered side uh, what they would do is actually just flip the airplane on this cradle I mean, physically they would turn it over right physically turn it over and I think some people have mentioned that they've seen pictures of it on the tower inverted. Inverted, yeah. So now are we going to keep that on here? No, no. That This is all just a, a configuration from Rome um, that we do not need. Okay, but I, I notice here if we look in the, uh, the landing gear bay, there's no landing gear here. Uh, what are we going to do about that? That's, uh, and and what, what kind of landing gear did it have? I know there's been a lot of stories about it had A7 landing gear, that it had B-58 landing gear. So uh, why don't you tell us what you've, uh, you've all discovered a little bit. Okay, well, when the airplane was sent to Rome, of course, it didn't need landing gear. It didn't need a whole lot of stuff. So all of these parts were stripped off. Uh, even the main landing gear doors uh, were taken. And at Rome, these were just covered with sheet aluminum panels. Uh, certainly not airworthy, flightworthy, or anything that uh, would resemble uh, the airplane as it was built. Um, the aircraft had uh, two main gears, one on each side, and because of the spacing up in here, the wheel had to rotate horizontally 
so it would fit up into the wheel well. Um, so it's a unique design. It's essentially the same design that's being used today. Um, I think you were saying earlier, though, that the wheels themselves were different. Landing gear was, yeah, was made the landing gear uh, was designed by uh, Manasco, which built all of the landing gear for the uh, the production F-16s. But in the interest of keeping costs down, uh, General Dynamics had some spare uh, wheels and tires from the B-58 program, and they became the main gear. And then there was, uh, at some point, uh, Air Force had some, some surplus uh, T-39 wheels and tires. And then at that point, uh, so they were just incorporated into the design. It was something you had to go uh, design, invent, draw up or anything. It was, uh, it was an off-the-shelf piece of equipment and used it, kept the cost down. So we don't have landing gear, but we've got all the other pieces, right? Yes. I mean, we don't have the wings on it right now. We no. don't have the tail or the vertical uh, or the ventrals. Yeah, the wings, uh, the vertical stabilizer, and the ventral fins uh, that go down here behind the jack uh, are all in storage. Um, and as we get to the point of getting the fuselage pretty much in shape and ready to accept the other parts, uh, we'll work on them and then uh, at some point put it all back together. And while, I, while I'm showing the canopy again too now, the, the canopy on this one is the original YF canopy and the, the production canopy is different, correct? Yes, yeah. There is a difference. Uh, the production canopy was about three inches taller. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of room in this airplane. And if, if you had a pilot that was over six feet, uh, he'd lower the canopy. And the next thing you know is uh, the canopy's hitting him in the head. <laughs> okay. Uh, and we've got something else up here on the top. I, I don't remember ever seeing these on an F-16, a handle on top of the airplane. <laughs> no, there's one up there and then one down behind the jack stand. And these were used at, uh, at Rome Laboratory. When it was mounted on the tower, uh, it gave them access into the inside because they, they had uh, various wiring panels in here for all the test wiring and the implementation. Um, and so that would give them an access into the fuselage. Uh, the airplane, of course, has no engine, uh, but it's a nice work area. <laughs> so I could see some uh, avionics people in there uh, fiddling with their antenna cables and whatever else and, and uh, hooking everything up. Well, something we, we kind of alluded to earlier on is that uh, uh, this airplane has probably, in many respects, done more for North Texas and, uh, and Fort Worth than any of the other airplanes that have come out of the plant. 4,600 of these have been built, mm -hmm. uh, and that equates to about $75 billion direct impact to the economy. Yeah. I know we've had people in here that uh, told us that their parents worked for Lockheed or, or General Dynamics and that this airplane put them through high school and college and law school and all of those kinds of things. So the, the impact of this airplane can't be understated. And uh, why this airplane? Uh, was there a competition going on for airplanes or why this airplane? Because this airplane now is used by like 25 different countries. Yeah, well, at the, at the time it came along, it was, uh, the Air Force was building the, uh, the F-111 out here at General Dynamics, but the program was coming toward an end, and there was nothing else on the horizon until this, uh, this group of officers in the air staff decided that fighters were getting bigger and bigger and, and more costly. And uh, so they came up with this program, and it was basically a lightweight fighter demonstration program. There was no intent to go to production other than... So nobody had even actually asked for this, had they? No, no. It was only after uh, they finished the test program. It was about 250 flights on each of the two airplanes. And the Air Force looked at the performance and says, Wow, <laughs> you know, we may have something here. So they ended up uh, ordering 650 of them, and that was all they were going to order. And... Uh, today it's up over 4,600. Let's talk about this a little bit because the kids always want to, when they see the airplanes here, they want to know about the guns. Okay. So what is what is this? This is the gun muzzle. Uh, there was a, a six-barrel Gatling gun, 20 millimeters, a uh, little less than an inch in uh, diameter. The ammunition drum uh, was behind the canopy, and then the gun itself laid in this section here. And when you would fire, of course, you have gas is coming out uh, from the, the end of the, the gun and this was uh, basically a diffuser to uh, 
deflect the gases away from being sucked into the inlet and, and putting the engine out. Well, I thought I read somewhere where the original models, the Azer Bs, had two 20 millimeter cannons on it, but then they converted to the Gatling gun later on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it was one of the production changes. And let's talk about the nose cone for a little bit, because we, we got this with two different nose cones, but what we've found is that neither one of them were originals. Yeah, if you, if you come up here, uh, this is the original contour of the YF nose section. Um, yeah, I think everybody can see that line the way it comes up here to this bulkhead. Yeah, and then this is original skin. They put a larger bulkhead on the front end to accommodate the radar um, and the antenna that fed on, set on front of that. And you can see the difference in contour right here. What we have to do is get it back to its original uh, nose contour so it does look like a YF-16 and not just any other F-16. That's cool. So we've got a big challenge ahead of us to put this back into its regular configuration. Uh, we have to report to the Air Force Museum everything that we do on this airplane, and annually we'll be sending them uh, pictures. But initially when we started to talk to them about the airplane and what we wanted to do, uh, Bill came up with a plan of work and uh, submitted it to them, and uh, they said, wow, this is a lot more than anybody ever really wants to do on an airplane, but... Uh, uh, but yes, absolutely. And one other thing before we go, because we've been doing this about 20 minutes, there's the outline of something else up here on the top of the fuselage. What is that? This section here? Yeah, the dark gray section. One of the things that uh, is in the later F-16s are external fuel tanks. They're conformal tanks. Uh, they match the contour of the fuselage and then uh, stick out. Uh, it, it basically changes the external shape of the airplane. And when you're running antenna tests, of course, you want to make the airplane look like a for real production airplane. So they made these uh, sheet metal uh, fuel tanks, external tanks, and that's the sort of the scar of uh, when they put them on the airplane and, and then they took them off before they sent them to us. Okay, a couple more things. One of the, uh, This looks like it's got plywood or something on it. What is that? This, uh, this is another change that was made um, the, the landing gear doors fit right here, and this is the original skin, but there was a contour change made in front of and behind uh, the uh, main gear doors, and so the trick is, is to get this off. And what's that made of? It looks like it, plywood, but I don't it, think it's it is. A, it's, it's almost like a yeah, resin-impregnated uh, plywood, phenolic. Okay. Well, let's show them the turkey feathers, and then uh, I think we'll call it a call it a day here on the, on the airplane because we've done pretty much, and we've been on here now for just about 20 minutes. Oh, where's the speed brakes on this airplane? Right here. So those just split open. Just both of them, uh, both of them 60 degrees and down 60 degrees. Cool. Okay. Got the uh, here. The fake end. <laughs> the fake end. Yeah, uh, the airplane doesn't have an engine, in it. and so to simulate the the back end of the engine, the exhaust section, uh, out of the airplane, uh, Rome made this uh, sheet aluminum structure and just bolted it onto the back so it looked like you know, it was an engine there. But. Okay, cool. So are we going to put this back on? Hopefully not. Okay. Hopefully We're we can find some real, the real back end of an engine to put on there so it looks normal and not just a piece of okay. black painted sheet aluminum. All right, so uh, before we go off, uh, we've got some viewers here. Does anybody have a question that they want to ask of uh, Bill or myself before we, uh, we end this session of Fun with Aviation? Give them a chance to type if they've got something. Well, Mike James, uh, you're very welcome. We're glad to be able to bring this to you. We'll be doing another one on Saturday. Uh, don't know what the airplane is going to be yet, but we'll do something. And uh, I'm going to do a little uh, bonus tour after this. If you give me about 10 minutes to uh, reposition, I'm going to go inside the museum and do a, uh, a short briefing on, uh, on this, uh, not necessarily this airplane, but all the airplanes that have been produced here and what the significance is. So uh, for now, I'd like to uh, thank Bill for being with us here today and uh, telling us all about his knowledge. Uh, oh, here's one more question. Time frame to uh, get this thing back together. 
uh, we have no timeline. Uh, as you can see, we have a great deal of work to do. Uh, we have no intention of just rushing forward to, you know, scrape all the old paint off, patch all the old holes, and then make it, paint it to make it look like it was so the YF-16. It We're could take us a year. Oh, yes. Yeah. And then uh, one other question we've got here from, uh, uh, from uh, Eric Shaw is what paint scheme are we going to put it in? Red, white, and blue. Red, white, and blue. Yep, that's the one we're going to do. So uh, at any rate, thanks, Bill, for being out here today.